This tutorial is going to show you how to use OpenRocket, which is a design and simulation software for model rockets. You can download it by going to openrocket.info, which takes you to this page here. At the time I'm making this video, the current version is 15.03. Uh, there haven't been any updates in the past several years. It looks like the last version was released in March of 2015. Download the program by clicking the download button here on the main page. Uh, I'm going to put it on my desktop. I already have a version there, but I'm just going to create another one. This isn't a program that you install. Instead, it's an executable Java file. And so you can rename it, save it anywhere you want. We'll hit enter. It's going to download to my desktop. You need to make sure that you have a current version of Java installed on your computer. So you can do that by Googling install Java and then go down to download free Java software and click this link here in the middle. Uh, definitely make sure you do this before you try running OpenRocket. It's really finicky when you try to get it uh, running for the first time. Sometimes your computer doesn't really know what to do with this file type. Um, you can usually just double click on the file and it'll open right up. If that doesn't work, you can go to notepad. You can type in Java space dash jar space open rocket2.jar. That's what I've named the file. You just need to make sure that this matches whatever the name of the file is. And then hit save, and I'm gonna name this fix open rocket dot bat dot bat. That's the important part. And then hit save. That's gonna create a batch file which is going to force Windows to open up open rocket using Java. So I double click that, it'll open up a command prompt window, it'll run that piece of code and open rocket will open up here in the front. Um, and then I should have mentioned before, I'm trying to make this video be as short as possible, but if you want to get through it faster, you can click the little gear icon on the YouTube video and play it back at two times speed. When open rocket opens, th this is the main page you're going to see. There's three different tabs. There's rocket design, motors and configuration, and flight simulations. We're going to start with rocket design. In the top left is your part tree. It's going to list all of the components in your rocket and it's going to show them as main assemblies and sub assemblies that you can collapse and expand. You'll see that here in a bit. On the top right, we have add new component where you can have nose cone, body tube, transition, fins, you know, inner tube couplers, all of these things that you can add to your rocket, parachute, streamer, shock cord, and then some arbitrary mass component. Um, to represent some other thing that you put into your rocket, like maybe a camera or some electronics or some payload. Here in the bottom, you have where the rocket is going to be displayed with some scales and some information about your rocket. Um, what's really important over here is the stability of your rocket, which I'll go over later. Uh, before getting started, I recommend going to Preferences, Units, and doing default imperial, and then changing acceleration to G and mass to grams, just because it's uh, easier to measure things in grams because it's such a small unit. Acceleration will make more sense if you're looking at it in terms of Gs, because that's kind of a number that you'll be used to. Um, and then using imperial units, just because a lot of the parts you'll be buying uh, are going to be listed in inches and feet. So you can hit close there. So let's just jump right in um, and add a nose cone. I'm gonna build a three inch diameter rocket. So I'm gonna change my base diameter to three inches. And I'm going to change my nose cone length. Usually you want it between three and five times your diameter. And I know that the nose cone that I'm gonna buy is going to be 11 inches long. You can change the nose cone shape. You can make it conical. Uh, ogive, ellipsoid, this is going to depend on what you design and build yourself or what you purchase. Um, I like ogive because I think it looks cool. Um, and then this shape parameter, basically it says here in the description, is going to determine how tangent this arc is to your body tube. At one, it's perfectly tangent. Um, as you get closer to zero, it becomes more conical. So zero is basically a perfect cone, whereas at 0.5, you can see it's, it's not perfectly tangent, but it has some curvature to it. Um, so I'm gonna just leave that at one. You can put a wall thickness 
Um, I actually don't know what the wall thickness of this nose cone is that I'm going to buy, but I'm just going to put 0.1 for now. Um, and what's important is that you're just specifying, specifying you know, all of the geometric properties of the nose cone. And then you're going to go over here and set the density. And using that information, Open Rocket is going to give you a component mass estimate here on the bottom left corner of this window. So it's really important that you pay attention to the component material. I've taught a lot of people in the past several years how to build a model rocket and how to use this program. And one thing that people most often forget to do is to change the material selection. And so Open Rocket thinks that you have this entirely cardboard rocket that weighs next to nothing. Um, and that's actually not going to be the case. So I'm going to scroll down and maybe set it to polystyrene. And right now it thinks that it weighs 114 grams. Next is component finish. There are only a few options. You can't really set a coefficient of drag for your rocket. Uh, there is another program called RockSim, but it's like $125. That program allows you to put a different coefficient of drag and adjust it as you want. Open Rocket because it's free, it just has limited capability. And in this case, uh, you can go with, you know, maybe regular paint is probably going to be most realistic. And you can click Set for All to make all of your components that. The next thing you want to do is, is add a, a shoulder to your nose cone. This is something that people forget to do often as well, but your nose cone is not just going to be this, this cone shape right here. There's a portion of it that inserts into your body tube. Since I have a three inch rocket, it's probably going to be a three inch long shoulder so that it has a one to one ratio between that diameter and length of the part that connects to the body tube. And then I know, I just happen to know that it's 2.93 inches in diameter and that's uh, how this nose cone comes. I'm going to put a thickness of 0.1 inches like the rest of the nose cone and then this nose cone does come with an end capped right here. This is a, it's not an open nose cone. You can like stick your finger up inside it. It has a bottom to it so I'm going to check that. So now you can see it is estimating 170 grams but what you're going to want to do is when this, when you go online, you buy this nose cone, it comes in the mail, you're going to want to throw it on a scale and figure out how much it actually weighs. Um, and say I get it and it has a weight of, you know, a mass of 200 grams actually. And so uh, you're going to want to go and, and update this and you're going to want to do this with all of the components that you make or buy um, because if you're trying to hit a specific altitude or if you're trying to just at the very least know or estimate how high this rocket is going to go, um, you're going to want to have accurate masses so that it can calculate the trajectory properly. Uh, the next tab is appearance. You can, I don't really usually bother with this, but you can go in here and, for instance, change the color of the, the lines down here. And then on this bottom section, you can change uh, some 3D rendering colors. If you go over here to this view type, you can change to a 3D uh, view of the rocket. And I think that that's what this does. And then last, you can leave comments if you want. So moving on, you can add a body tube. Um, I know that I'm going to get a body tube from Balsa Machining. If you go to this website where they sell very cheap rocketry components, you can go to low power body tubes and couplers. And the T334 body tube right here uh, is the one that I'm going to be using with the nose cone. So it's 34 inches long. Uh, that's what it comes in. It uh, has the inner diameter of 2.93. Uh, it auto calculates the wall thickness based on the diameters that I've input. Um, and then this is actually made of cardboard, so we can leave it that way. Um, the component mass right now is estimated to 124 grams, and I can override that when I get the tube in the mail and I weigh it and find out what it actually weighs. Now, one thing with model rockets is, is that the rocket motor is going to be significantly smaller than the body tube. And so you need a tube inside of your tube to hold that motor. Um, if you scroll up here on Balsam Machining, you can see that they sell a 29 millimeter motor mount size. And then that's called the T52H-34. So rather than inputting all of this information like I did with my body tube, I can actually go to the database here, click from database, and I can type T52H and it will pull up balsammachining.com T52H-34 and it has everything in the database for me. So I need to click that check mark and hit OK. 
and it's going to input all of that information. Sometimes it doesn't. You might have to go to this drop down and make sure that you have it selected. Um, but that's going to input everything for you. You'll see here that they actually used paper as the component material. Uh, it looks like it's almost double the density of the default cardboard. Um, but it's different than this paper here that is already in the program. So that's kind of the usefulness of, of using the database is that it has a preset density. And you're going to get a pretty accurate measurement um, of the component mass. But again, you're still going to want to make sure when you get the part in the mail. Um, 34 inches is really excessive. You can probably get away with doing like 8 inches because um, that's going to be able to accommodate a wide range of motors. And the motor can even stick out the top of the motor mount tube and still be fine. Now, you need a way to keep that inner tube inside of your body tube um, and constrain it there. So that's what centering rings do. Um, you can see here I've actually made a mistake. I had this inner tube highlighted when I clicked center tube, centering ring. So it's actually put the centering ring inside of my inner tube. Um, so I can hit the delete key and it'll delete that. And now I want to actually click body tube and then click centering ring. And it's going to put the centering ring inside of this body tube assembly rather than putting it into a further sub assembly at a, at a lower level inside of the inner tube. Now, because I've got my body tube and my inner tube already in the model, it knows what diameters the inner and outer diameter of this centering ring need to be. So all I need to change is the thickness. You can use quarter inch plywood because that's really cheap at uh, the hardware store. And then make sure to set it to plywood component material. And then I like to give myself a little bit of room. So I'm going to put point negative five inches from the bottom of the parent component, which is the body tube. I can use a different reference point to measure from and um, put the centering ring where I want it to be in my model. So now one centering ring is not going to be enough to constrain this. It would not be very rigid in there. So I can do control C, control V and create a second one and then edit the second ring to move it further up inside of the rocket and constrain my tube that way. Now we can add some fins. There are a variety of kinds. I usually just go with trapezoidal because um, I, I haven't really seen a reason to do anything fancier than that. I can change the number of fins here. I'm gonna go with four. Uh, fin rotation doesn't really do anything, but fin cant does. Um, essentially, it's going to skew your fins and make them so that they're not perfectly vertical compared to the rocket. Um, this is going to make your rocket spin. Some people like to do that because it makes the rocket more stable as it flies, as it sort of uh, rotates as it flies through the air. Um, but I'm just going to keep it zero so it flies nice and straight without rotating. Um, we'll see if I can build it that way, though. That's easier said than done. The root cord is this length here on the fin. So I'm going to make it five inches. And you can see it update there. And then the tip cord is the length of this second horizontal line here. Um, I'm going to make that two inches. The fin height is the distance between those two horizontal lines. A good rule of thumb is to have it uh, at least the same as the diameter of the rocket, which in this case I'm doing a three inch diameter rocket, so I'm going to do three inch high fins. Your sweep length is how far your fin sweep back. You'll see if I put it at zero, there's a completely vertical line right here. Whereas if I put the sweep length at three, now there's a completely horizontal or vertical line at the back, um, just because I've got you know a five inch root. I can change either the angle or the length, and as you change one, it will automatically update the other. So you can sweep them back, or you can sweep them forward and you can sort of play around and make your fins look the way that you want them to. Um, I'm gonna do a sweep length of 1.5, positive 1.5, and just have a perfect trapezoid. And then you can move the location of your fins along the length of the rocket, again, relative to some position. It defaults to the bottom, and I'm gonna move them, I don't know, a half inch forward, because I think that that looks pretty cool. The cross-section of the fin is really important. 
Um, if you're using plywood and you cut it out maybe with a laser cutter or a bandsaw, you're gonna have a square cross section. Um, I'm gonna put rounded so that it's going to assume that the leading edge of the fin right here is sanded and rounded rather than a blunt square edge slamming into the air as it flies. Um, I'm gonna use quarter inch plywood for the fins, so I'm gonna update that there and then adjust the density or the material selection here to plywood and keep it as regular paint. Um, fillets, right now I've got a zero radius for fin fillets, um, but I could estimate or measure the density of some glue. I could scroll down to the bottom and create a custom density. So maybe I find out that epoxy is 0.1 ounces per inch cubed in density and I end up putting a one inch radius fillet on all of my fins. And that's just helpful because it's going to adjust the component mass. Um, fin tabs are going to fill in this section here between the body tube and the inner tube. Um, right now you'll see that my fins are basically just perfect trapezoids. When you click on an item, it highlights it in bold lines. But what I want to do is I want to have tabs that stick out of the fin and allow the fin to go and be inserted through a slot in the body tube and be glued against the inner tube and against these centering rings just so I have a, a higher strength bond. Um, one thing you can usually do is you can click calculate automatically. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It looks like in this case it broke and didn't want to do it. Um, so I can calculate the difference between my body tube diameter and my inner tube diameter. Divide that by two, it's 0.895. So that's how high I want it to be, 0.895. And it looks like that was the only part of it that failed. It, it managed to calculate the position of the tab and the tab length. And so if I close this window and click on the fins, you'll see it, it's like a funky looking house. It has this rectangular portion that fits in between uh, the centering rings. And I'll be able to put glue on all of these surfaces and make sure that that fin is really bonded on. And it's all interlocking, so it's really hard for it to break apart. Again, you can override the mass. And here it's going to be the mass of all four fins. Okay, so you want to measure all four fins at the same time on the scale. And just reviewing what a fillet is, if you look at the back view, it's not gonna show it, um, but it's going to be basically a curved portion of glue that takes this sort of 90 degree angle between your fin and the body of the rocket and puts a structural fillet of glue right here uh, just for better bonding of the fin and making sure that it doesn't break off. Now, if you go back to this inner tube, you can click the motor tab and you can say this component is a motor mount. And this is telling Open Rocket, I'm going to put a motor inside of this tube. Um, That's the purpose of this tube. And maybe it's going to overhang 0.5 inches and you'll see what that does later. Um, we're gonna leave that as it is and I'm not gonna go over any of this other stuff because uh, it's, it's a little advanced and it's not necessary for this video. So now if we go to Motors and Configuration, we can click New Configuration. You'll see here that Open Rocket is expecting the motor to go inside of the inner tube, not the body tube. You can click and highlight this inner tube right here and then hit Select Motor and it brings up this uh, Select a Rocket Motor window. There is a list of different motor vendors. Right now I just have Aerotech because those are usually the motors that we fly with. Um, I'm going to look at G and H motors, so I can use these sliders to filter by that. And I have a 1.14 diameter motor mount tube, so that's all I'm going to look at. And then I can go over here and I can sort by different parameters, designation, impulse, diameter, length. Uh, I'm going to sort by designation, and then I'm going to choose the G74W. And then what I can do is up here on the ejection charge delay, I'm probably going to use the nine second one. So what's going to happen if you go over to the show details tab, you can see the different uh, characteristics of this motor and it burns for 1.12 seconds. Now after those 1.12 seconds are over, there's going to be a nine second delay before a black powder charge bursts out the top of the rocket motor, pressurizes the inside of my rocket, pops my nose cone off, 
and then allows my parachute to come out and bring my rocket down for a soft landing. Um, if I set it at four and my rocket takes, I don't know, 10 seconds to get to apogee or its peak altitude, Open Rocket is going to think that this ejection charge is going to happen, you know, 5.12 seconds into flight, 1.12 plus 4. Um, you don't want Open Rocket thinking that, and you also don't want to do that in real life because you'll disassemble your rocket mid flight while it's flying a couple hundred miles an hour. So we'll leave that at 9, and uh, we'll look here. You can see there's the thrust curve over time. You can see the 1.12 seconds burn time. Uh, it gradually increases in thrust, maintains a pretty steady thrust level, and then tapers off at the end. Um, we're going to hit OK, and then what we can do is we can actually click New Configuration and select another motor and do some compare and contrast. So maybe I wanted to compare what the flight of the rocket would look like if I were to throw an H125W that burns for two and a half seconds. Um, it's a 98% H. So you can see an H motor is between 160 newton seconds and 320 newton seconds of total impulse. Uh, this is at 317, which is nearly the top of that range. It's almost an I motor. Um, you can see the launch mass, which is 323 grams, compared to the empty mass, which is 134. So you have almost 200 grams of fuel in this motor. Um, and then it has a very different thrust curve than that last motor did. This is really, really quickly goes up to full thrust, um, just sort of punches off the pad and then slowly loses thrust over the duration of the burn. So uh, we'll leave this at a 14 second uh, delay charge and we'll hit OK. Um, now we'll see what this overhang does. It shows that the, the motor is overhanging outside the rocket uh, ever so slightly by, I think we put half an inch. I think that's extreme, I'm gonna change it to quarter inch, um, but that is really what the motor looks like in real life. It has a lip and doesn't fully go into the rocket and it overhangs by a bit, so I think that this is more realistic. Here on flight configuration, you can now compare and contrast what the rocket looks like with these different motors. Um, and one thing that you're gonna notice that changes is the stability of the rocket. So this blue symbol here is your center of gravity, and that's where the rocket is gonna balance on your finger, um, where that center of mass is, compared to your center of pressure, which is where your aerodynamic forces all boil down to a single point load. And you want your center of pressure to be behind your center of gravity so that the rocket maintains uh, a stable flight pointing up, and that as it pivots around the center of gravity, uh, it can correct itself and continue flying up. And you want these points to be a specific distance apart so that you don't run the risk of it flipping end over end during flight. Um, and so that, that's what this number right here is. This is your static margin of stability. Um, right now it's 2.11. And what that means is it's a factor of the body diameter. So the body is three inches. So this uh, means that these two points are are three times 2.11 inches apart, so about six inches. Um, you want this number to, between, to be between one and two. Um, greater than two means you're gonna be overstable, and so it's just gonna continually overcorrect during flight, but then less than one means it's too unstable and likely to corkscrew and lose control. Um, so you can see that if I put this larger motor in, I become less stable because it's very tail heavy as compared to this smaller, lighter motor, um, which distributes the weight differently. So that's something to keep in mind. It's pretty difficult to design a rocket to handle a variety of different rocket motors. So as long as they're similar size and mass, you can get away with flying the same rocket on different motors. Um, but as you can see, if it's you know four times or three times as long and weighs significantly more, it's going to have a huge impact on the stability. Um, a couple things you can do to change the stability or change the size of your fins because your center of pressure is really a function of the surface area of your rocket. So if you move your fins back, your center of pressure will move back, or if you make them smaller, your center of pressure will also move. Um, or you can change your center of gravity by adding mass to the tip of your nose cone, gluing some heavy piece of metal or steel BBs to the front of the rocket uh, inside the nose cone can make your rocket more stable by moving your center of gravity forward. So those are things definitely that you're gonna to wanna to be paying attention to. 
Um, in the body tube, you're gonna wanna add a parachute. Let's say I want a 36 inch parachute. Uh, I never really mess with the coefficient of drag because I haven't been able to find parachutes online for purchase that have uh, drag information like that. Um, number of shrouds and line length doesn't really matter. What I like to play with is the packed length. Let's say it's four inches and the diameter is two inches and you can see it's gonna take up more of a realistic amount of space inside my rocket. And then I'm gonna move it to a point where it's actually gonna be sitting during flight, which is maybe right about there. And then I'll hit close. Um, you'll also have a shock cord and that way uh, when your nose cone pops off, when your injection charge goes off, it's going to link your nose cone to your parachute to your body tube and keep everything in one tied together piece. And let's say that that's five inches long and two inches in diameter, and we're gonna move it down to sit between the nose cone and the parachute. Um, you're gonna want this cord to maybe be about five times the length of your rocket. Open Rocket will let you do math, so you can do 45 times five, it's 225 inches. And again, it doesn't matter what um, type of shock cord material you put because all it cares about is the density. Uh, so when you buy it and you cut it to length, just override the mass and, and put it in as, as whatever it actually is. Um, so this is a pretty basic rocket, kind of covers our bases. It looks like we're pretty uh, overstable actually. So we can go in and maybe change our fin height from three to 2.75, um, maybe, um, put them back towards the bottom of the rocket completely. And uh, maybe even go to 2.5 and put it closer to two inches, or two inches, two caliber of stability. And then last is the flight simulations tab. So what you're gonna wanna do is click edit simulation. Um, if you're launching with the Utah Rocket Club, you'll be at about 5,300 feet you'll probably have about a six foot or 72 inch launch rail pointed straight into the air. Um, you can play with average wind speed or turbulence if you want to. Uh, right now it defaults to using the International Standard Atmosphere Database. So it's going to estimate a temperature and a pressure based on your altitude. Um, you can override that if you are really interested in doing that. Maybe it's uh, 65 degrees on launch day and the atmospheric pressure is 28 inches of mercury. Um, not to 28. Um, and that's going to affect the, the simulation. You can save this as your default and that way every new simulation that you make uh, preloads those same options. Um, you can go back here and you can play with different uh, calculations that Open Rocket will use to estimate the flight of the rocket, but I usually just leave it as the default. Um, if you highlight both of these and then hit run, it will estimate how fast your rocket is going to fly, how high it's going to fly. Um, based on those ejection charge numbers, nine seconds and 14 seconds, it's going to tell you what the optimum delay would be in a perfect world and how long it's going to take for your rocket to fly to Apogee. And you're gonna to wanna to make adjustments based on this information. Um, you can see that the shorter burning motor that doesn't take your rocket as high only lasts 96 seconds of full flight duration, whereas this larger motor is going to turn that 96, 96 second flight into 223 seconds. Um, and then last what's really important is your ground hit velocity. So you can see that because we have that 36 inch parachute and our rocket weighs 643 grams with the motor, uh, that this is gonna be how quickly we hit the ground, the speed up upon impact. You want it to be, I would say around 20, um, some websites say under 25. Um, so with this information, we probably see now we could go down a size on parachute. Although, you know, that means that if you go down a size, you do run the risk of breaking your fins on impact, um, but it will fall straight down and you'll be able to see it. If you use a larger parachute, it's probably gonna drift farther away and you're, you're gonna end up walking a mile or two or maybe even losing the rocket. Um, so it's just kind of a trade-off that you you, you have to look at and figure out what you want to do. Um, now we have a simulation for each motor, but you can also just create a new simulation. Um, you can specify which motor you want to use, and maybe you want to compare uh, if it's 15 mile an hour winds instead of 4.5, or what would happen if I launch it at a different place. So maybe I'm launching it at 5,000 feet instead of uh, 5,300. 
And you, and you can run different simulations with these same two motors and compare the results based on those different uh, parameters, if it's more windy or less windy or if you're at a different altitude. Um, that's pretty much how the program works. There's quite a bit more to it if you really get into the details, um, but it's really important that you're as detail-oriented as possible and that you override those masses and that you add every component you can possibly think of and that you know, at the end of the day, when you have your fully assembled rocket with the motor inside, that it weighs what Open Rocket thinks it's going to weigh. Um, if you're in a competition and you're trying to target a specific altitude, you're going to be more accurate if you have your model built well. And that's why it's going to be kind of a living document. It's not something that you put together once and then leave alone. Um, you're going to want to update this document frequently as you make changes to the design and as you build the rocket and you add all this glue and this paint, it ends up being a lot heavier than you thought. And then as you start gluing things together, it's really hard to measure individual component masses. So maybe if you hover over body tube, it'll tell you that there's a 356 gram total for the body tube and everything inside of it. So you might have to do some math and figure out, you know, what things have, have started to weigh more now that you've been gluing things up. Um, you can see here that if I open up the file for Wasatch 1, which is the rocket that the high power team built for the 2018 Spaceport America Cup. Uh, we try to be as detailed as possible. We have every bit of hardware in the rocket was accounted for. Every single camera, every single screw, um, all of the drogue chutes and the main parachutes with the swivels and the, the links for all of the uh, cords being hooked together. We overrode all of the masses and kept it kind of going as we went. And in fact, we even have three versions of the file based on each flight that has the different flight location simulation data. And we were able to kind of fine tune things as we went. Um, so that's it for Open Rocket. I only covered a lot of the basics. Um, one last thing I'll point out is that the simulation data doesn't ever really match what's down here. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. I think it's just because of those parameters like temperature and pressure and launch altitude uh, are getting factored in when you run this simulation. And last, if you want to, you can plot and export different data. You can add different axes with different estimates for wind velocity, air temperature, uh, CP location over time, uh, total acceleration, whatever you want, which is pretty cool that you can look at those kinds of things. And, uh, even compare them with the flight data if you put an altimeter in your rocket. Um, the BYU Rocketry leadership team has a pretty good knowledge of how this program works, so definitely go to them with any additional questions you have. Um, but you might run into something that they're not familiar with, and you might have to do some research online finding an answer. Um, another thing it, I've come across is sometimes the motor that you want to use doesn't exist in this database. And so you can download motor files from thrustcurve.org. You can go to preferences and you can actually um, add in different user-defined thrust curves and add to the database so that you can use a different motor or maybe Aerotech has released a brand new motor that's not in this current release of Open Rocket. So hopefully this gets you started into rocketry and shows you how fun and exciting it can be. Um, but definitely I would recommend sticking with it at least through the launch of your first rocket because it's a lot more fun when you've spent all this time and effort designing and simulating the rocket. Um, and then once you've built it, you get to see it launch and that's probably the most exciting part. So good luck and uh, don't forget to change the material selection from cardboard to what it actually is.